दिक्कत नहीं ओके थैंक यू वेरी मच कमिंग टू दिस प्लेस इज लाइक विजिटिंग माई फ्रेंड्स कमल निखिल करुणा एंड विजय ऑल ऑफ अस हैव ग्रोन टुगेदर इन दिस यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफकोर्स आई मस्ट हैव ज्वाइन मच अर्लियर दैन दे ज्वाइन बट वी हैव बिन डिबेटिंग डिस्कसिंग फाइटिंग स्ट्रगलिंग टू अंडरस्टैंड थिंग्स टुगेदर फॉर मेनी डिकेट्स नाउ सो इट्स ऑलवेज प्लेजर टू कम टू दिस प्लेस एंड दयाल सिंह कॉलेज हैड मेनी ऑफ माई फ्रेंड्स अर्लियर ऑल्सो सो इट्स अन ऑस्टैलजिक फीलिंग टू कम हेयर लेट वी बिगिन बाय पंडित नेहरू रिमेंबरिंग पंडित नेहरू एज निखिल एज मैंसन पंडित नेहरू नेम एंड आई शेयर टू स्टोरीज अबाउट हिम विच आई रियली लव अबाउट हिज रिलेशन विथ एकेडमिक्स वन इज अबाउट निराला यू मस्ट हैव हर्ड अबाउट सूर्यकांत त्रिपाठी निराला ही वॉज अ बिंदास मैन ही यूज टू डोनेट ऑल हिज थिंग्स टू अदर्स सो गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया फिक्सड अप सम फिक्स सम फेलोशिप फॉर हिम तो जो पैसा उनको मिलता था महीने के दो तीन चार दिन के अंदर वो सबको देवे के ख़त्म कर देते थे तो फिर नेहरू जी ने कहा कि भाई ये तो बड़ा मुश्किल है हमेशा इनका पैसा ख़त्म हो जाता है तो उन्होंने महादेवी वर्मा को कहा यू शुड कीप हिज अकाउंट सो द मनी विल कम टू महादेवी वर्मा एंड शी विल गिव मनी टू निराला सो दैट मनी लास्ट एटलीस्ट अ मंथ आफ्टर फ्यू मंथ्स महादेवी वर्मा रोड टू नेहरू दैट आई एम सॉरी आई कॉन्ट मैनेज दिस he not only takes away his own money in the first week of the month the rest of the month see since i am responsible for keeping his money he takes away my money also <laughs> so nehru said okay let me arrange something else so that was the kind of relationship between between intellectuals and the prime minister of india which probably we can't imagine any more the second story about another famous thinker and writer hazari prasad devedi he was in Uh, Shanti Niketan. So he wrote a letter to Nehru. Uh, Nehru ji, uh, uh, the amount of money that I am getting in Shanti Niketan is not sufficient any more, even for the papers that I need to write. The only habit I have where I spend some money is, or bad habit that I have is one cup of tea in the morning, which I have stopped. to save money to buy papers so i am contemplating that it is difficult to stay here with this money i want to come to delhi please arrange some fellowship for me and nehru wrote back saying these are available online you can have a look at that nehru wrote back to him uh, dwedi ji i will arrange for some more money for you please don't leave nasanti niketan at the moment your being in santi niketan niketan is very important so the prime minister of india was connected with intellectuals like that and that was pandit nehru whom probably if india forgets if india tries to forget him that, that will be really tragic in fact it is difficult to forget him because he is the one who left the mark on the pages of history which cannot be erased so the initial phase of india when we were struggling to come out from the colonial phase it was nehru's vision that put us on the global map not only in the in terms of in terms of infrastructure but also in terms of philosophy the idea of non alignment thinking of idea of non alignment at that time which gave leadership to india was an amazing idea i think so let's remember that nehru nehru uh, if you look at nehru's writings uh, you will find that he was one who was also struggling between these two phase these two uh, uh, poles modernity and tradition yes. everywhere he was, you find, you see that struggle in his life if you watch his uh, the serial based on his book uh, bharat ek khoj you will see almost in every episode he comes back to this issue that how do we need to negotiate between modernity and tradition so therefore this has been one of the issues for all of us right from nehru to a villager in the village i have a project which is called mapping knowledge and practice in india 
the idea of the project is this only that did modernity create any rupture in the thought process of indian people how do common people handle the philosophical challenge of modernity with the academy since i can understand we have changed almost either we have changed we have become modern or we have we conceal our tradition so there is a situation which is called ghore baire in the outside we are modern inside we are very, very traditional like i have many friends who are absolutely modern outside but when i visited their home they were sitting on puja so i asked them kya kar rahe ho matlab maine mera beta kar raha hai maine kaha koi baat nahi except that these are these are kind of contradiction that we are facing so modernity tradition i think if you go to the villages one of the villages where i was doing my field work the entire village was divided in two parts one was the modernist and one was the traditionalist and there used to be physical fight between the two the modernist would drink smoke dress differently and the traditionalist would dress differently and would be against smoking and against drinking so there was a site of conflict on the pan dukan or was that that tea tea dukan always there was a conflict going on there so this is interesting challenge intellectual challenge that we have been facing as colonial country as post colonial country where modernity a form of modernity came from outside not that we were not becoming modern in fact this is another debate going on that is there is only one modernity or there are multiple modernities what would have happened if britishers would not have come to india yadi angrez yahan nahi aate to kya hota kya hum traditional reh jate ya hamare yahan bhi kuch modernity ka kaam chal raha tha already aur hum dusre tarah se modern hote ya jo modernity unhone la ke hame diya kya humne use waise hi accept kar liya or we became modern in our own way so these are the debates that coming up on this so i am really thankful to somebody who selected this topic or designed this topic when nikhil called me that this is the topic and if you want to change it i realized that this was a wonderful occasion to reflect upon this contradiction that we have been facing so this is the major contradiction that we have been facing so i will divide my lecture mainly in two parts one part i will look at look into this contradiction and see how uh, this contradiction throws different kinds of challenges and is there any way to transcend this contradiction and think in a different way about modern thought a modern political thought and second i will try to give some examples how modern political thought ha th uh, the the thinkers of modern india have negotiated between modernity and tradition and what what are the issues on which we can see the negotiation very clearly so let me first begin by suggesting that india is a old civilization very old civilization and please do not attach this statement of mine with the identity politics of india because these days there is a tendency to assert that india has everything india had everything the moment somebody says very old civilization that means we are superior civilization i'm not saying that i'm simply saying that we have a long history and there are certain features in indian history that we have to really remember one that there are several civilizations that came to us and we had a dialogue with them we had conflict with them and dialogue with them so there is a big tradition of dialogue in indian tradition and that is what i want to demonstrate and suggest that the the issue of assimilation between two contradictory trends of thought is not we are not facing it for the first time we have faced it several times in history and we have negotiated with that and very well negotiated with that and what is called today indian intellectual tradition or indian political thought is a result of that negotiation in fact I would like to bring the metaphor used by Tagore when he was speaking on Ram Mohan Roy. He says that intellectual traditions are like river, and the rivers are flowing continuously. And sometimes, what happens? The flow is blocked. When the flow is blocked, because a lot of things are assimilated in the river or 
the, st the path is stopped by some other obstacles then there is a meditative flow happens people some people emerge who would clean the river and the river will, river will start flowing once again so indian tradition you will see several times it happened that the flow of the river became slow narrow or blocked and somebody would come and open that flow to make it continuous process so that is how you can imagine indian political thought which has evolved throughout the centuries and millennia so i will give evidence how one can look at that evolution let me just emphasize on this point that how this these points of negotiation have worked and then we can look at the modern negotiation what are the modern negotiations suggesting the first negotiation that goes to my mind is the 6th century bc imagine 6th century bc there was a place called vaishali in bihar and imagine that space in 10 kilometers radius you have mahatma buddha mahavir jain ajit kes kambal and experts of upanishad all of them were living in the 10 kilometers radius and they were continuously debating long debates were happening fights were happening in fact at that time let me tell you a story there was a person a very rich person young person whose father passed away early he was a businessman and a king sent a message that i want some money from him so his mother told him that the king is coming he will get some money and he wants to see you he said but he wants money that is fine why does he want to meet me he said well since he is taking money he would all like to meet you he said no please tell them tell the king that i can give as much as money he wants i don't need to meet him but then mother insisted and the businessman the king came he met he gave lot of money and the next day this young man left his house became a jain sadhu he said if even if i have so much of money and i have no freedom then what is the point of having money because i need freedom and he left so this was not being debated only among the intellectuals that is the point i want to bring that this was everyday life debate going on there are have hundreds of stories to demonstrate that how these philosophies were living philosophy for common people and there was a big struggle among these philosophers and common people on philosophical issues so then what happened a wonderful negotiation took place and a new philosophy emerged there at that time what was the new philosophy it was anekantvad that all of us know only partial truth if you know partial truth then there is no point in fighting against each other let us come together debate discuss and arrive on the better truth so you must have heard about six blind men and an elephant so to comprehend all of us have partial understanding of the truth so we really have to struggle to understand the truth and that is why you no need to fight that philosophy became very powerful and a peace established and dialogue started at that time second phase the greeks came to india all of us know alexander came to india there was a big fight alexander came to india also with a set of people to collect documents from india a lot of books and texts were collected from india because a lot of intellectuals were met and their ideas were taken so there was a and some of them were left here so there's a very nice research by by art historian who suggests that how that time greek society got deeply influenced by indians and indian society got deeply influenced by greeks i'll not give you examples of the influence but i'll only suggest that how that dialogue took place only one example let me give there is a greek logic what is aristotelian logic what is that wherever there is smoke there is fire there is smoke if there is smoke somewhere then you conclude that there is fire so this logic became very dominant at that time this was indian or greek i don't know but that was the do dominant logic and either greeks took it from here or greeks brought it to this place and that became dominant at some stage then 
a teacher who was teaching this Greek logic, his wife came from kitchen, brought a mud pot full of smoke and broke the mud pot there and asked, here is the smoke, where is the fire? Now that's a big challenge. That changed the logic system, Indian logic system. Indian logic system became five-stage logic system against three-stage logic system. What are the three stage, five stage logic system? Wherever there is fire, there is smoke. If there is smoke, there is a possibility of fire. And then you go and empirically examine whether fire is there or not. So then whole question of evidence came. And this became later on uh, one of the dominant trends to argue against Hegel in Germany. I'll, I'll tell you how that happened sometime later. So. This kind of debate happened at that time. Then you have another time, 4th century AD, the Gupta period. And they funded Buddhist monasteries. In fact, during the Gupta period, the Nalanda University, which was known as Buddhist University, was most flourishing university. And people from China, from other places used to come there. And the dialogue that took place in, in that area, interestingly, was deep dialogue between Indian tradition and uh, between Hindu, tra Hindu tradition of Nyaya, that logic, and the Buddhist logic. There are a couple of books documenting this dialogue very nicely. So you have another period after that, the Muslims came to India, the Arab, Indo-Arab relationship. There also you will find there was a place in, uh, uh, in, in near Iran where there used to be a big market for medicinal plants or medicines and Indian medicine used to be exported there and Greeks and Turks everybody would be coming there to collect medicines and that time medicine was not separated from philosophy so philosophy was exported through medicine in the entire Arab world and they also brought a lot of things from Arab world the one story I can share with you of Panchtantra somebody from Arab world was sent to India 2500 years ago to collect Amrit. They thought that in India there is something called Amrit and that can keep make human beings immortal. So the king sent one person here. He kept moving around and he did not get anything. So he met somebody. He said, look, there is nothing called Amrit here. Here is a text. You go and give this text to your king and tell him if he can rule his people with this text, then he will become immortal. That text is still being taught in Greek, in, in Arab world with the name of Dabnak Kartak story. Even now, there are a lot of Persian writings on this text available. So this is how dialogues happen in India. I think series of dialogues one can quote. The last dialogue, I would quote the Darashiko time. Of course, Akbar was one of them, but Darashiko was very, very interestingly, he translated the Upanishads and that translated Upanishad was taken by the uh, 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 the French traveler translated into Latin and that became a text for global exposure and also in the modern period also with coming of the British when they brought a new idea it was not either accepted or rejected I think there was a dialogue between the two but I suggest that if you want to look at the dialogue, there can be two ways of looking at it. One way is putting one against the other and comparing. Other way is transcending both of them. If you want to put one against the other, then in the Indian thought, this problem al always remains. Whether it is modern, whether it is tradition. Like Patho Chatterjee will say that this is a derivative discourse they have taken from the modern. or Lord Bhikkhu Parekh would say that let us see how the tradition is being, is being modernized or modern is being traditionalized. So that is one kind of debate they will keep going. I think there is another way of looking at the history of Indian thought, particularly in the modern, modern period. That is to see what was the concern of these thinkers, modern Indian thinkers particularly. The concern of the modern Indian thinkers I think was human liberation and universal human liberation. 
so one can look at this now this negotiation between tradition and modernity from this angle that how these thinkers were trying to approach both the traditions as available resources and from those resources they want to extract things appropriate things to construct a better philosophy of the world to construct a better strategy which can through which they can fight against multi prone enemies like capitalism colonialism religious conservatism casteism so many structures of domination we we were handling with probably they were trying to grapple with much more complex society than the european world had then when modernity were modernity emerged so these thinkers were trying to bring out things from both the traditions to create something new what is this new they were creating i don't know i don't think we have yet really worked very hard on that i think they were thinking beyond modernity and tradition it is not either modernity or tradition that was there was no choice between the two i think both were resources but they were creating something beyond that that one of the conceptual frames that i think that they were trying to create beyond was i call it ethical realism that ethics and realism to, together i will not go into that but i'll just say that how i'll show i'll demonstrate that how they were trying to negotiate between two traditions and there i will take few examples let me take first example that is arthashastra kautilya's arthashastra most of you must have read kautilya's arthashastra right my question in that is that can there be a society where state is very powerful without a theory of state can you create a big building without creating a map you cannot similarly if you want to create a powerful state you will have to have a theory of state or if you want to or if i want to argue that if you have a theory of state can there be a theory of state without theory of power no you cannot have impossible which means that reading kotilya's text have to be different di different probably we are not reading the text very nicely there is a small chapter in kotilya's book called desire i think that is a core idea of the book how do you regulate human desire why do you need to govern ourselves because we need to regulate our desires and that's how if you enter there you will see kotilya builds a full system of regulating the desire now you very well know that there were pre kotilian art shastra is it it there were sugriniti and so many of them so there are pre kotilian art shastra or i want to assert that gandhi was in the tradition of art shastra actually and that's a very controversial statement <laughs> but let me support this argument see in the pre kotilian art shastra if you look at that that was only about administration kotilya's innovation was what what did kotilya innovate kotilya was the first power first person to argue that governance cannot be done without understanding the consciousness of people and therefore if you look at his first chapter he says the king or anybody who wants to read art shastra must have prior knowledge of logic must have prior knowledge of sankhya sankhya is a philosophy of consciousness i give another support to the argument kotilya says never attack the state whose king is very popular among the people it means you really have to map the consciousness of the people in order to run the state or attack the state so kotilya brought the idea of consciousness and he was a system builder If you look at Arth Shastra, he talks about everything. A system builder is one who talks about everything, who gives a complete system. What is a system? Which has many organs, and those organs are interconnected. So Kautilya Arth Shastra is like that. It is not only about sovereignty. It is not only about theory of justice. It is not only about governance. 
it is about everything. This is a system, complete system. The only person after Cotillia in my known uh, uh, history, in the known history, was Gandhi, who writes on everything. Gandhi has a very interesting text on food, how to eat and how not to eat and what to eat, what not to eat, right from there. To all aspects of life you will find that Gandhi is talking about. And what was Gandhi's innovation in governance? Gandhi's innovation in governance was communication. Cotillia's innovation was consciousness, study of consciousness, political consciousness. And Gandhi added in that communication that in order to regulate the consciousness, you have to learn to communicate. And what, is it, what did he do? Look at the way he dressed himself. Why did he dress himself like that? He had to communicate with the peasantry. His idea of ashram, absolute communication, nothing is hidden. Here is the open space. So Gandhi, Gandhi's idea of communication, Prarthana Sabha. He knew fairly well that if you start giving only political lecture, nobody will go, come. You have to first speak about Gita, then talk about politics, then only it will be possible. He was a master communicator. Imagine there was no radio, akhwar or anything and he was communicating to the masses in the village. So that was, a, he was a master communicator. So there is a full continuity from Cotillia to him. You can look at the elements available and connected in that. And then you can see how Gandhi designed his idea of, Satyagra, idea of Satyagraha. As I said, Anikantvad was the basis for his Satyagraha. Gandhi said that I am basically an Anikantvadi. I am trying to bring the idea from Anikantvad to the modern period for political struggle. During the Anikantvad, remember it was not a political struggle. It was an intellectual struggle for which it was designed. And Gandhi brought that to the political struggle. So this kind of a struggle continuously helped Gandhi in redesigning or renegotiating between tradition and modernity and going something beyond that. Then you have, I, I'll take a couple of more examples and end there and leave it to you to raise questions. Take for example, religion. What is the modern idea of religion? That religion must be pushed in the private domain, isn't it? What is the traditional idea of religion? That religion is, has to be very important. And how these people negotiated with that? They did not say that close religious places or ban religious practices. They said, I, I neither that nor that religion is our identity, we don't want to leave that. They engaged with religion, developed an internal critique of religion and transformed religion. So continuously they were struggling on that. If you look at right from Ram Mohan Roy, Ram Mohan Roy was given an option. It was, rather he was attacked. He was told by his contemporary Western intellectuals that in order to argue against Sati, you should take, a, take the help of the idea of equality, liberty and fraternity. Roy said, no, I'm sorry. I will not taking, I'm not taking the help of that. For which he has been critiqued by even Sumit Sarkar. What did he do? He said, let me read the text. And he adopted three step strategy. First, read the text, refute the text by text. So saying that what you are suggesting is not written in the text. That's the first stage. He says that text suggests something else and the practice is something else. That is the first questioning. Second thing then he said, that between Sati, he said, text is suggesting that if somebody becomes widow, she should either become Sati or live an ascetic life. Now, text is very clear on this, that becoming Sati is not desirable actually, because you are ending one's life, taking away one's life is not desirable. Therefore, you have to live the ascetic life. The opponents of Ram Mohan Rai argued that, well, but since living ascetic life is very difficult, therefore Sati should be committed. Then he argued, but who makes that difficult? They don't, they don't make their own life difficult. Only the males can make that difficult. Therefore, males are, males are responsible for that. And then he argued, why males are able to do that? Because women don't have property right. Somebody who is the queen in the house, the moment she becomes widow, 
she has no no right in the house so this is a strategy he adopted to refute religion by religion same strategy you will find has been adopted by many thinkers after that advanced upon this by vivekanand who said when he was funded to go to us by the landlords he went there defended everything undefendable in hinduism and when he came back in chennai he was being welcomed by all these landlords who funded him and he said these landlords are responsible for all the problems indian people are facing <laughs> so look at the kind of refutation that he did then you come to gandhi he says i am not worried why people are becoming religious i am worried people are becoming irreligious because what they are thinking is religion can't be religion we must teach religion but who will teach religion not these malvis and pandits they don't they should not teach religion religion should be taught by modern educated western intellectual let them teach religion or vivekananda said if religion does not stand with science then that should be rejected religion should be re the, the the part of religion that is not compatible with modern science that should be completely rejected so this is a new kind of negotiation taking place so what is happening to tradition and modernity here i think their concern is not tradition and modernity tradition either tradition or modernity the concern is going beyond tradition and modernity the last example i will take and i'll drop here is well let me give one more example in religion then i'll come to the last example one more example in religion is ambedkar he never said you should abandon religion he says we must religion is very important for society but what kind of religion he said there are two kinds of religions religion of rules and religion of principles and religion of rules is constructed by ruling classes religion of principle is a core idea of religion and that must be accepted and all religions need reform and all religions need to get rid of the religion of rules not only that there is an article by him widely known marx or buddha and he says that buddha is much more advanced than marx because buddha has another element of consciousness which marx's writings don't have and therefore buddha is very advanced so what is the negotiation i think he was influenced by marxism to begin with then he read buddhism and ultimately he became buddhist but what kind of buddhist a new kind of buddhist not old kind of buddhist so this is what they were doing all of them were i think trying to transcend this binary and creating a new idea the last point i want to make about swaraj the idea of swaraj look at the evolution of idea of swaraj people trace the history of swaraj from some upanishad or some rigved somewhere could be but how they discovered rediscovered this idea the first time when dada bhai naroji talks about swaraj that is economic swaraj and mainly home rule kind of thing that we have to remain within the dominion status or dom within the ruling class ruling power of britain but inside us we give some autonomy our wealth is being drained then tilak comes he says not only that we also need administrative swaraj and some cultural swaraj and then comes gandhi who expands the idea of swaraj completely and his swaraj means swaraj of all kinds its centrality of of me the decision making power should come to me and I, we should have autonomy to think the cognitive freedom gandhi is talking about cognitive freedom that we have we should be free to think how should we live there should not be control on that and then beyond that you see kc bhattacharya who says not only swaraj of culture or politics or all that also swaraj of ideas swaraj in ideas let us experiment with ideas not that we reject other ideas but we must reclaim the ideas in which we are born we are born in a collective consciousness and you can keep expanding that and that is the last point i want to make that the negotiation between tradition and modernity in order to look for something beyond is an unfinished agenda that is the unfinished agenda of the 
for founding fathers of India. And now you can reimagine what kind of new negotiations one has to take. Not that one has to go back to either tradition or modernity. There is a tendency today to go back to tradition or go back to modernity and fight again in this binary. The binary is not an appropriate thing. That is what they suggested. And once again, when we are looking for our future, the new future we are thinking of, new utopia that we want to construct, we should not think in terms of binaries. We think, so, think in terms of going beyond the binaries, creating new liberative idea that can liberate us and other human beings also. That is the project that this kind of negotiation throws instead of looking at the boundaries, uh, the binaries. Thank you very much. Everybody.